You spoke about players fearing LeBron, and then this was the play you referenced. I'm so glad you found this play. I've been trying to find this play somewhere for the last 11 years. All right, JJ, appreciate you coming on the show. We talked on your podcast a few years ago and you said you weren't really a highlight player. But the last couple of days I've been going through all this stuff and there's plenty to go through, uh, especially with the Duke days. What's the first thing you think about when you think of your Duke career? It's probably off-court moments because the off-court moments meant so much to me. I think of specific games for sure. The Texas game, of course, my senior year, the UVA game where I scored 40 on 13 shots. For me, the biggest moment I had in my career, because it was such an important thing, was my shot against Miami, where I, I, I hit a three right in front of our bench, which broke the Duke scoring record. The ACC scoring record wasn't even on my radar, but beating the Johnny Dawkins record, that was amazing. And the fact that he was five feet away from me when I hit that shot, and there's a still photo from the, the, the baseline of that shot, looking at me head on. And in the background is my parents, in the background is a number of my teammates. That moment probably stands out more than more than any other. Had I won a national championship, that, that probably would have stood out the most, but didn't quite get there. When you look up your highlights on YouTube, right? Especially the Duke highlights, everyone says, wow, I forgot JJ was so versatile. I forgot he could finish around the rim. Have you noticed that all, like people forget how good you were because of your NBA career in college? You have to understand something. I heard that from the time I was in high school. My kids now, they, they are dying to watch JJ Redick highlights on YouTube. I have to type that in sometimes in the morning before school. And we rewatch re re a bunch of games together. And even in my freshman year, you know, I think of like a UVA game when I had 34 and broke the Duke scoring record for freshmen. And I took it off the bounce a little bit in that game. And you can hear the announcers, Dickie V and Mike Patrick talking about, he's not just a shooter. He has the ability to put it on the ground. And it's so funny to me because I also hear a lot, oh, JJ Redick was a beast at Duke. Like he shot so well at Duke. And I'm like, yeah, I did in my NBA career too. I was a beast in the NBA. Like, it's just a different level. Do your kids have any idea of how famous and popular you were at that time? You know, I don't think they do. They know I was a good shooter. Like my five-year-old will often ask me, dad, dad, what were you in free throw percentage all time? Were you number nine, right? You're number nine, is that right? <laughs> like he just likes to confirm those facts. I did feel at the time there was a, a little bit of a weird celebrity for a college basketball player that I had, especially my senior year. Only guy I can think of that really had that insane amount, and probably more so than I did, insane amount of hype and fame in college was Zion. I mean, that's really the one example I can think of in the last 15 years. Do you think about what would happen if your Duke career started now with mm. social media, the NIL, all this stuff? Yeah, I probably would have made the taxpayer mid-level in college. I think right. that's, I probably, yeah. <laughs> when I was in college, the Duke bookstore alone, the on-campus bookstore, sold somewhere between five and 7,000 of my jerseys, my Duke number four jerseys, my senior year. This is just in one year they sold that. And those jerseys went for anywhere from 75 to 100 bucks a pop. And I didn't, I didn't see a dollar of that. I'm very grateful, obviously, for my college education, but I'm also acutely aware of the fact that the NCAA stopped being an amateur business a long, long, long time ago. And I'm so happy that the players, you know, maybe they don't share in the TV revenue, but I'm so happy and grateful that they get to share in some of the money being made. Um, and, and regulation will come on this. And right now it feels a little bit like the wild, wild west, but yeah, I, I, I would have, I would have made good money. I would have made good money. I would have had a lot of social media followers had I kept them for my entire NBA career. I'd probably yeah. had a lot more than I have right now. <laughs> right. One of my favorite plays uh, of your NBA career is you got PG here with that pump fake. It's kind of like one of your patented moves, right? Yeah. You know, so much of getting space in the NBA to get my shot off was about using my shot fake. And I used it on closeouts all the time. I used it on spot ups, you know, just being able to keep the defender off balance. You look at this clip and it's Paul George guarding me. And had I shot the ball on the catch, he's probably going to get a great contest, potentially even get a piece of the ball. Did it ever surprise you that people always kind of fell for the pump fake? Whether a defender was in a help position and then closing in that manner, or if I was coming off screens, and I was able to create separation using my body, using my speed to get around uh, picks. 
I always felt like a defender. I had the advantage and I was, you know, the defender was at my mercy at that point. And so that shot fake, the threat of my shot, the threat of my three pointer was a huge advantage in my career. And, you know, I, I sidestepped three years, but there's so many times that I sidestepped and I'd go inside the three point line, hit a mid range pull up, get to the basket, shoot a floater, whatever it may be. You know, I was never an ISO guy, but I was able to score off the dribble at an efficient way because of my shot fake. You spoke about players fearing LeBron, and then this was the play you referenced. I didn't find it on YouTube, so I went through the ESPN archives and finally found it. What was going through your mind uh, during this play? <laughs> I'm so <laughs> glad you found this play. I've been trying to find this play somewhere for the last 11 years. You know, I knew that LeBron liked to spin back to his right hand. I knew he liked to do that left dribble over the left shoulder spin. And so it was just anticipating it. But as soon as I got into position, I, I'm not allowed to cuss on this, of course, but as soon as I got, I got into position, I'm like, oh snap, like I'm about to get crushed. And he hit me with his elbow above my eye. So I'm bleeding down my eye, I got stitches. I came back for the second half. I definitely was concussed. This was before the concussion protocols. Eddie House came up to me at halftime. And he's like, bro, I thought you were down for the count. I'm shocked you're out here right now. Yeah. It wasn't just the elbow though. Like there was a lot of body contact that I absorbed right. there. And LeBron, is he was so strong. He was so big and fast, specifically in those Miami years. The clip where you get LeBron's ankles and you don't finish. <laughs> how, how much does it bother you that you didn't finish it? <laughs> it, it <laughs> It bothers me a lot. And it doesn't count as a highlight. I've talked about this on the podcast so many I, times. Omar, I'm I talking know. about this. It doesn't count. It's not a highlight. It's it's a cool drill move, but it's not a highlight. But this one, I really do think you put him in a spin cycle. Yes. Would you agree with that? Yes. I, I, I put him in a spin cycle. I didn't push off LeBron. I just used that little hesitation. Eh step back dribble behind the back and i got him i got him in a spin cycle but i missed the shot so it's not a highlight it's not a highlight I, it bothers me though i fell against kirk heinrich kirk heinrich had me isoed at the top of the key it was the simplest in and out right to left crossover and i fell he made me fall your teammates gave you the hardest time about that play what were they saying to you oh they loved it they loved it here's the thing because of what i went through at duke you know in terms of the animosity directed my way i've always I developed very thick skin. And so my teammates always knew they could make fun of me and it, I would never take it personally. You know, I could give it back, which was fun, but I, I didn't take any offense. To that. I thought it was hilarious. I mean, look, if my teammate got crossed over by Kirk Heinrich and fell at the top of the key, I'm also going to make fun of them. You better believe there are going to be multiple instances the rest of the season where I bring that play up. It's, it's absolutely warranted. Game seven, your play against Steph Curry. Does this count for you as breaking someone's ankles? <laughs> it's it's in the gray area. It's in the gray okay. area because I didn't really make a move. I just drove the ball in the opposite way of, of his body direction. Uh, and that was a move I used a lot. Even in high school, I developed a, a real good understanding of, of how to attack closeouts because, again, I knew the value of my shooting and I knew the desperation that defenders would close out to me with. And so, yeah, I, th this is a highlight. This is a highlight. This counts. You know, my only regret on this play, and Chris Paul probably to this day remembers this and probably remembers yelling at me, is that it was a two-pointer. I didn't get the puppy oh. behind the line. And Chris mm -hmm. used to get, and it didn't happen a lot, but Chris used to get so mad at me every time I would make a shot uh, with my toe on the line. The game winner versus the Blazers. Was the play drawn up for you? It was, it was. You know, the, it was an interesting sequence uh, of that game. We had kind of gone back and forth. Doc put me in, I don't remember, but normally I would go back in the, in the fourth quarter at like six minutes or seven minutes, and he waited a long time to put me back in. And I played one offensive possession with about a minute and a half or two minutes to go and, and missed a shot. And truthfully, I was like kind of in a bad mood because I hadn't played, you know, I, he would take me out at six minutes in the third. I was in a bad mood because I was like, I didn't get my normal, my normal minutes tonight. It's a close game. I'd, I'd had some success against the Blazers up to that point when I was with the Clippers. And I felt like it was a team that I could really score against and help the team win against. And uh, I just remember it was similar to the play um, that I had in New Orleans with the Pelicans when I had the lefty lay off the glass against the Kings. 
knowing the play was called for me, I would go out on the court and there's just this overwhelming sense of calm that I would have. Like, it's my it's my turn. I don't always get the game winner, but here's my opportunity. I never felt nervous in the moment. I just felt very calm and focused. You know, that play, uh, again, I just, I used Rash Rashawn Holmes sort of aggression on that closeout against me. I knew he was going to do that. I knew I could turn the corner and get all the way to the basket. And on the crisp play, if we go back to that, I think what was most remarkable about that game winner was that he nutmegged Mason Plumley. He had the wherewithal to nutmeg Mason Plumley on a game winning shot. Uh, kudos to him. And you can see me pointing to him there. And that was me just acknowledging to Chris what a great pass that was. You talked about being calm and not nervous during you know the final play. Of all the players left in the playoffs right now, who do you most trust to hit a game winning shot? Yeah, I mean, I, I trust a lot of guys to hit game winning shots. You know, I trust Tatum. Jalen Brown kicks it out. Smart fakes inside. Tatum spins and he puts it in. Celtics go up by one. I trust Steph. Steph for the win. Yes, sir. Now, guarding Kobe in the NBA Finals, there were a few moments where you had to guard him. I guess, what was the number one thing you were thinking about? I've said this before with Kobe, like you can play tough D on Kobe and he's either going to make a shot or miss a shot. And I don't know why you're only showing highlights of him scoring on me because I got multiple stops in this series. I want to make a point. You okay. must have, this is definitely, by the way, this is definitely you looking back at a YouTube clip and finding yes. Kobe Bryant highlights yes. from yes. game five. Guilty. Yeah, when he closed us out. Yeah, he made Guilty. some shots on me that Guilty. game. Absolutely. But it, earlier in the series, I had gotten some stops, and I came in at the end of game one. I got two or three stops on him. Well, I think J.J. Redick is clearly the Kobe stopper. <laughs> had some stops on him in game four. We should have won that game up 87-82 with under a minute to go. But, yeah, I haven't held on to that either. I, Omar, I, I hold on to all these things. I hold on. Right. They're, they're internalized in my soul forever. <laughs> the shot versus the Pacers, the one over Miles Turner. Yes. What are you thinking about here? Because... It looks like a shot's a little different, right? Because he's bigger. Yeah. This was a shot that I, you know, it's interesting. I practiced a lot of weird shots, uh, especially in the off season and in the season at the end of every workout, I would practice shooting over my left shoulder, different game winners, because that's generally how the play was drawn up. The interesting thing about this play, we had played Houston about a week prior to this game, late in the fourth, and it was a similar play. I, I was a little bit deeper on the right wing but I had the same exact shot and I shot it the same way, a little more of a push shot going up because I had a big on me and I had to get it off at the end of the shot clock. And I shot it and it was like, oh, that that's online. And it was a little short, hit the front of the rim, um, you know, not front of the rim and back, but front of the rim and then hit the backboard and, and rolled off. And I just remember on this play, like same shot, I've made it before, I practiced this shot. Uh, I'm gonna put a little extra juice on it. And I probably put a little extra arc on that one too, because it was Miles Turner. But as soon as I shot it, I knew it was going in. I knew it was going in. That was not a surprising shot to me. The last two clips for me, one of them is your Lego costume on Halloween. What was the process on this and how long did it take or was it pretty simple? No, it was pretty simple. My, my wife and uh, my wife has a twin sister and for the last, I don't know, six years, we've, we've gone all out for, for Halloween. This year we were all Avengers characters. I was in a full Ant-Man suit. Unfortunately, it was about two inches too short in the legs. So there was a lot of pressure on my midsection. So I couldn't wear it out in public. The genesis of this, New Orleans is a heck of a place. My favorite place that I've lived. We went trick or treating before the game. We went uh, down to, I think it was State Street and just went house by house for four or five blocks. We took some pictures. All the kids were dressed up as Lego characters. My wife, her twin, her husband, everybody was dressed up as Lego characters. And they were like, are you gonna change for the game? And I had made a decision because it was the end of my career. I'd made a decision. You know what? I'm just gonna not be so uptight. I've always been so uptight about professionalism. I'm not gonna be so uptight. I think it'd be funny if I wore my, my Halloween costume to the game. That same week, I made the decision, I'm going to start wearing neon shoes because I've always worn either white shoes or black shoes. We can now wear different colored shoes. I'm going to start wearing neon shoes. I'm not going to be this head case that walks around thinking that all these things actually matter in the grand scheme of things. And so I, I just I went for it, man. I thought it was I thought it was a decent costume. It was good. Not my best costume ever, but it was a decent costume. Last clip for me, the shot against the Lakers. 
What do you think was the hardest thing about guarding you, especially in transition? I had a pretty good idea of where to go and how fast to get to places. So there were times where I'd be on a dead on sprint to create that angle from a guy like CP or a guy like TJ McConnell or a guy like Ben. There were times where I would sort of trail back or I'd have bursts of speeds. It was all about sort of getting to a passing angle. People ask me all the time, what's the best shot you've ever hit in your career? And I said, this shot. This shot to me is the best shot. Um, I'm behind the backboard. Uh, I'm on a dead sprint. And there's a moment as I'm running to the corner and the ball's in the air where I kind of look down to make sure I'm still in bounds and, and I can get my feet set behind the three-point line. So the combination of all that, um, and I remember TJ and I used to have like a joke whenever one of us would hit a tough shot, we'd look at each other and be like, that's tough, that's tough. And TJ, of course, is standing right over me, picking me up off the floor when I make it. And uh, I definitely said that to him. That was a tough shot. Is this the ultimate like years of preparation? Cause I'm sure you work on something similar, right? Or no? Oh, I worked, I worked on that all the time. Again, I go back to that shot against Miles Turner. Like I practiced everything. There wasn't a shot that I ever took in a game that I didn't practice. And I, I would put myself, whether it was in season after a shoot around or after a practice or in the off season, I would put myself in game situations and I'd have to make a certain amount of shots practicing shots like this. Um, and, you know, we brought this up on the Pablo pod. I would practice shots drawing attention to the, the foul. You know, I would come off a, a step up screen and I would flail my legs and shoot the ball like that and spread my arms because sometimes you do get fouled. And so you want to be able to have that concentration and that sort of uh, callback to being able to make it. How did it feel? I was always a visual person, but I was also a feel person. And, and so putting yourself in those situations and sort of letting that mind-body flow happen, that's where magic happens. That's where a shot like that happens. Well, JJ, thank you for the time, my man. Yeah, always good to see you. Always good to see you. I'll come back whenever you want.